uh, since 2003 until the latest joint registry results were released, the total knee replacement surgery has increased by 72%, but over the same period, unicompartmental knee replacement has decreased by 37%. So looking further at the registry to try and work out whether there might be an explanation in it, I found this which would at least partially explain uh, the decline in unicompartmental knee replacement use. And here we can see when we look at the top, the unicompartmental knee replacement group, the, um, the cumulative percentage revision rate at 10 years is 15.1% uh, when we compare that to a total knee replacement revision rate at 10 years, it's three times higher. Now, as somebody who uses a unicompartmental knee replacement, I've then got to try and justify those results against my use of the uh, uni knee replacement. And so just going back to the start and looking at the reasons that somebody would use a unicompartmental knee replacement, there have been well publicised and published uh, um, advantages of a uni knee replacement over a total knee replacement. The kinematics are better because they retain the cruciate ligaments and therefore you're going to end up with a better range of motion, better function, especially with demanding activities such as stair climbing. As far as we can measure, is as good as a, uni, as a total knee replacement. Complications, because of smaller surgery, are going to be less. And I use the, do the mini, a uni knee replacement with a minimally invasive incision and so that's potentially... Uh, allows for more rapid recovery and lower cost and as I'll explain when I'm talking about the uni, I'm talking about the uni I use which is the meniscal bearing Oxford, um, uh, the wear properties of that uh, improved. Now Cam has specifically asked me to mention the lateral in, in this discussion. I, the, the, what I'm talking about is both medial and lateral but I thought I would just concentrate on the lateral when talking about the kinematics and I just want to talk about around kinematics and wear just to highlight some of the advantages that might be there with a uni over a total. So when we look at the different compartments, the medial compartment and the lateral compartment, they're fundamentally different compartments. They operate in different ways. On the medial side, we have a, with a meniscal bearing uni knee replacement, we've got a spherical femoral component, a flat tibial component, and that works well um, up in the top right corner, I've just got a diagram of uh, Freeman's papers. He had three MRI papers which showed the difference in the movement on the medial side and the lateral side. So the medial side works well with that design, but that sort of design does not work well on the lateral side because of the increased movement and the increased rollback on the lateral side. So one of the latest designs with, with the Oxford is that they have changed the design of the lateral side to compensate for this and to come up with something which more closely replicates normal anatomy of a domed lateral side to allow for this rollback on the lateral side. So here's what the design of the latest uh, Oxford lateral is, which allows for this more, uh, more rollback on the lateral side. So just demonstrating this, on the medial side, that flat tibial component works well and allows for normal kinematics on that, that side. These are some fluoroscopic studies that I've done. But on the lateral side, again, with this dome component, it allows for more lateral rollback and external rotation on that side, which, again, will replicate what the normal anatomy or the normal function of the knee will do. We also did a cadaver study looking at this to maybe explain why, if you don't have normal kinematics on the lateral side, uh, the results aren't as good because the kinematics aren't the same. And all I did with this one was just looking at a cadaver with different radius of curvatures of the uh, domed lateral, just check to see what difference in tension of the lateral collateral ligament you might generate. And you can see that with a flat component in full flexion, you're going to, you're going to generate a lot more tension in the lateral ligament than you will with any of the domed laterals, but the 75 millimeter um, radius of curvature was chosen for that one because it most closely replicated normal anatomy. So when you are able to achieve normal kinematics, you are able to get better um, results, more normal function, range of motion impro improves. Now we don't all need this sort of degree of knee flexion. However, it was a patient, this is a patient that 
uh, I had done, he, he'd previously had a left fixed flat tibial component and he was bothered by the lack of flexion in this side. And although he doesn't have as much flexion as the previous case, he now has a more functional range of flexion on the right side with this component. So the results have shown that the range of motion does increase from about 110 to 130 pre and post-operatively and functional results are improved. If you do have altered lateral kinematics, because of the increased tension on the lateral side it will cause pain or impingement and impingement will, will cause reduced flexion, potentially increase wear or more catastrophically bearing dislocation. So here's a look at the, uh, why the wear properties are different. Uh, if you have a fixed bearing component or a flat on round non-congruous uh, uh, type of um, prosthesis, then you're going to have increased contact forces on the polyethylene. Increased contact forces cause polyethylene wear. Polyethylene wear causes osteolysis and failure. And that's why you do tend to see an increased failure rate with the fixed bearing components after 10 years. Initially, the functional results are similar, especially with the medial side, but after 10 years, we do tend to see more failures on the fixed bearing components, as opposed to a mobile bearing meniscal, uh, so a mobile bearing or a meniscal bearing component, where the linear wear rates have been documented at approximately 0.03 millimetres per year. Volumetric wear doesn't seem to be a problem as there doesn't say in any of the published series there's no osteolysis but the potential disadvantage of the mobile bearing is obviously uh, bearing dislocation. But in these published series the incidence of bearing dislocation is 0.4%. So if we move away from the kinematics and the function and the results of the joint registry and look at published series, it's interesting that the published series um, there's five series that I've quoted here, but they have a 10-year survival of between 92 and 100 per cent. One of those was the design centre, but the four others weren't. As a matter of fact, there was one, the SPARD series from Sweden, which is out to 20 years now, and that was presented in 2006, which showed a 20-year survival of 92 per cent. My own series, I um, have just presented here my first 100 unis that I did, both medial and lateral. They are all Oxfords um, in 88 patients with a mean follow-up of about two years. Here's just the demographics of what I've done. Initially, most of them were cemented, but I'm moving more to, towards cementless now. And as you would expect, um, most of them are medial with uh, well under 10% being lateral units, which is consistent with the, the number of patients who are, are suitable for a lateral uni. We look at the scores, the Oxford knee scores, as you would expect, increase preoperative and postoperatively and increase across the group, cementless, cementless and lateral. And the latest postoperative Oxford knee scores shows that most of them are clustered around the good and excellent results. The three revisions that I've had to perform in that group of 100 have been one for deep infection in a lateral uni, a stress fracture of a medial tibial plateau, and progression of osteoarthritis to the lateral compartment that in retrospect was an inappropriate indication because he was ACL deficient. So now let's go back to that initial, those initial results from the registry and compare them to the results that I've just shown you there. And Why is there a discrepancy between the two? And I think one of the things that I've... This was a paper by Goodfellow I think it was his last paper that was published in 2010, which looked at the New Zealand Joint Registry. And the New Zealand Joint Registry has something that our Joint Registry doesn't in that it has a functional outcome as well as uh, an outcome with revi uh, um, revision. So it uses the Oxford Knee Score to look at the functional results. When comparing the uni knee to the total knee, the uni knee does have better functional results, but it still has a higher revision rate. As you'd expect, for lower Oxford knee scores, there is an association with a higher revision rate. But if you take the group of patients that has an Oxford knee score of less than 20 in the uni knee replacement group, they have a 60% revision rate compared to the total knee replacement group with an Oxford knee score of less than 20, which only has a 10% revision rate. So that would suggest that there's a lower threshold for revising unis than there is for revising totals. 
So in summary, there is a significant proportion of early osteoarthritis which is limited to a single tibiofemoral joint, which is reported to be up to about 30%. The results of uni knee arthroplasty surgery are a complex interaction between function, wear, implant design, surgical technique and implant survival. So in, a pro in conclusion, in appropriate cases, a meniscal bearing uni knee replacement has a significant advantage over a total knee replacement, possibly over a fixed bearing uni. But the disadvantage is that there is a three times greater revision re rate reported in the National Joint Registry. Thank you very much indeed.